You guys remember that show called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs? Well, one of those episodes was called Mr. Pocket. You remember that? Now, for those of you out there that didn't see that, I'll give you a brief rundown of what happened. So, there was this old prospector and his mule going across the land, looking for a good place to prospect along the way. And he found a river that he was prospecting, and he started to find little bits and pieces of gold in the river, but not a lot. So he decided to get up onto the bench or the bank, and he noticed there was more gold there. So what did he do? He decided to mark out where the gold is. And in theory, he was correct. That's the way you should do it if you're finding gold up on the bench. So what did he do? He triangulated it, he worked his way up the hill, and when the gold stopped, he knew he was at the source. He dug down, and he found the pocket, thus Mr. Pocket. Now you're thinking, Jeff, what the heck does that got to do with today's show? Well, I thought wouldn't it be fun to talk about Virginia City and all the trials and tribulations that the miners went through? But here's the twist. We get Mr. Pocket to do all the narration. Ooh, wouldn't that be fun? Hmm? Now, before we get on with the show, in case you guys haven't noticed, this is just a sample of the stuff that we give away every month. I'll tell you more about it at the end of the video. All right, Mr. Pocket, you go ahead and start narrating, because I really want to know how he's going to do this. Working the Comstock load was extraordinarily dangerous. Apart from the risk of cave-ins and underground fires, miners had to worry about underground flooding. The temperature of water below 700 feet rose to 108 degrees. When miners penetrated through rock, steam and scalding water would pour into the tunnel and miners had to jump into cages, risking death if the hoisting mechanisms failed to lift them quickly enough. It was in Virginia City that Samuel Clemens acquired the pseudonym Mark Twain. At the age of 26 in the summer of 1862, with just $45 to his name, Clemens accepted a job as a $25 a week reporter for Virginia City's most influential daily newspaper. A year later, he began signing the name Mark Twain to his columns. In a letter to his mother, he described life in the rowdy mining town. I have just heard five pistol shots down the street. The pistol did its work well. Two of my friends were shot. Both died within three minutes. Scalding water, plummeting cage elevators, cave-ins, fiery explosions, toxic air. These were among the many hazards of silver ore mining on Nevada's Comstock Lode in the 1800s. Hazards that left people scarred, paralyzed, and dead. In the quest to mine silver ore, children were orphaned, women were widowed, and men were injured and unable to work to support themselves. The nature of mining society and the dangerous conditions in which miners worked in the mine shafts that ran beneath Virginia City and Gold Hill hard rock mining like that on the Comstock required tunneling deep into the ground to access pockets of silver ore. An intricate network of tunnels ran beneath the towns of Gold Hill and Virginia City, supported by a honeycomb of square-set timbering. New developments in mining technology simultaneously lessened some of the dangers while increasing others. Dynamite, mechanical rock drills, and new hoisting and timbering technologies allowed miners to tunnel deeper where they worked in temperatures between 100 and 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Water in the mines could reach 170 degrees. Hoists and cables lowered men nearly 3,000 feet down the mine shafts in cages. When those malfunctioned or collapsed, men could plummet to their deaths. Life was hard and death came early from the likes of pneumonia, TB, cholera, mining and industrial accidents, or any other number of maladies. Miners worked underground in the mines on 12-hour shifts and they did not have fancy work clothes or protective equipment. Working in temperatures as much as 120 degrees due to the hot water in the mines, they earned up to $4 per day, which made them the highest paid miners in the world. Living facilities for the single miners was generally a rooming or boarding house. The structures were not well insulated, and the walls often consisted of nothing more than canvas or cloth of some type to separate the sleeping areas. Miners would only rent the rooms for a 12-hour period as the guy on the opposite shift would rent it for sleeping for the other 12 hours. As time went on, many miners and mill workers either brought families with them to the area or acquired their family while working here on the Comstock. Meals in a small restaurant or chop house, their form of fast food, would be about 0.25 cents. They did not have nice warm boots or heavy coats or hard hats in the early days. 
Winters were much tougher than they are today, and the summers were hot with no air conditioning. Not less than 80 million feet of timber and lumber are annually consumed on the Comstock load. In a single mine, the Consolidated Virginia, timber is being buried at the rate of 6 million feet per annum, and in all other mines in like proportion. At the same time, about 250,000 cords of wood are consumed. The pine forest of the Sierra Nevada mountains are drawn upon for everything in the shape of wood or lumber, and have been thus drawn upon for many years. For a distance of 50 or 60 miles, all the hills of the eastern slope of the Sierras have been to a great extent denuded of trees of every kind. Those suitable only for wood, as well as those fit for the manufacture of lumber of use in the mines. The thick veins of silver were so soft they could sometimes be removed with just a shovel. Instead of the normally thin veins that were common in silver and gold ore, the Comstock load was sometimes hundreds of feet thick. Shafts were sunk to depths of up to 3,000 feet and cave-ins were common. Over the next two decades, nearly 7 million tons of silver was mined. The miners did not have an easy life. Provisions had to be shipped from California over the Sierra Nevada mountains and were very expensive. Although some miners became millionaires, others found little or no wealth. Many of the miners were criminals and lawlessness made the mining camps a dangerous place to live. Nevertheless, by 1860, Carson County's mining camps held more than 6,000 people. All the leading mines were soon taking out their tens of millions, but when the big bonanza was struck in the consolidated Virginia and California, the yield of gold and silver bullion soon became a matter of scores of millions. It was then that the fame of the Comstock spread to every corner of the world and the rush of speculators, fortune seekers, and adventurers of all ages, sexes, and classes was greater than ever before. Even though the big bonanza was struck in 1873, it was not until October 1874 that the excitement in regard to it reached its highest fever heat. The main shaft had then reached the 1,500-foot level, and the ore disclosed by drifts and chambers was of such extraordinary and astonishing richness that experts could hardly believe their eyes, or assayers, their figures. The Comstock load had a width between the cyanite wall on the west and the propolite on the east, 1,000 to 1,200 feet wide at the point where the big bonanza was struck. The space between the two walls was filled with what is locally termed vein material, or gang, and in this was found the ore body, or bonanza, which was in one place over 300 feet in width. This mass of ore yielded assays from $100 to $700 per ton, but in some places they found masses of pure native silver, with spots of ore so rich in black sulfuret and gold that to make assays of it was like making assays of the pure metals. From the Bonanza mines alone, from 1873 up to 1882, were taken out over $100 million of ore, but in 1879 the yield began to fall off as the vein was followed downward, and in 1882 the amount of bullion taken out was too small, not paying expenses. The Comstock was known for deep shafts, but one of the deepest is the combination shaft, and it was sunk to a depth of over 3,000 feet at the rate of 3 feet a day. The whole shaft is sunk in very hard rock, andesite, every foot of which had to be blasted. The dimensions of the shaft were 30 feet by 10 feet in size and is divided into four compartments for the accommodation of the hoisting and pumping apparatus. When the shaft was first sunk to a depth of 2,000 feet, huge volumes of water was encountered, so much that even the hoists could not keep up with it. Two Cornish pumps were lowered to the 2,400-foot level to be used to help alleviate such huge volumes of hot water, each with columns 15 inches in diameter. The shaft is connected with the Sutro drain tunnel at the depth of 1,600 foot to help ease the strain on the Cornish pumps. When one stood at the bottom level of the combination shaft and looked up one of the four compartment shafts, each measuring 5 feet by 6 feet in size, the little spot of daylight seen at the top appeared to be about four inches square. At this great depth, even the smallest bit of rock falling from the top whistles like a rifle ball before reaching the bottom, and striking a man on the head would instantly kill him. Should a man fall that distance, little would remain on which to hold an inquest. His body would be quite dissipated. The Cornish and the hydraulic pumps working together had a daily capacity of five million gallons, 
and the stations excavated for them were 85 feet long, 28 feet wide, and 12 feet high. All this space was so filled with machinery that there was only room left to move about among it. The total yield of the Big Bonanza in the California and Consolidated Virginia mines was a total of over $100 million, and when adjusted to today's gold and silver prices, it would yield a total of over $3 billion. Oh, that's out of the pit. That's new. I remember when we came back here years ago. That was open. Okay. When did it cave? I'm not sure exactly what year it caved in. Uh, gosh, I remember it was years ago, and it went back straight and then to the right, and it was looking really sketchy. Yeah. And well, they uh, tried digging it out and it caved in on them, so they, that's where that's they what they finished. I like the way you did the lighting in there. This is really nice. Yeah. And you got the old tugger in here and the Widowmakers, yep. column drills. And there's a jack leg right there. Look at that. And you got the rat tails hanging out of there, out of the face. Oh, this is new. You got some four by sixes in here. Look at that. It's like a blue robin's egg color at yeah. one time. Yep. Look at that. I bet you there's still values in there too. Well, the like gray is, is the silver itself. Yeah. And you know it's it's not high grade which is why they left it right that's what i kind of figured why it yeah. would still be here yeah but i'm glad they did leave it so yeah because so this is the only thing left it. yep it's the only thing left look at that now is there a high sulfide count in there yeah that's what i figured i can almost smell it and you can see it where it's starting to leach out mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. oh i bet you like that one huh and if you like that we got a whole bunch of controversial stuff coming up that's out there on the outer fringe. Remember we talked about that last week? Now, a lot of you guys out there said you wanted to know more about how you could use gold to cure cancer. And of course, why does man have this sensational desire to dig up gold? What happens if you eat gold, huh? What does the body do? And what exactly is Ormus anyway? And does gold possess secret qualities about it that nobody talks about or wants to talk about? Before I get on out of here, I want to give everybody out there a big cowboy yeehaw and shout out for all the, the kind messages and comments that you left me and wishing me well and a speedy recovery to get out of the hospital and of course get back to mining that gold because I know you want to see that gold. So I want to say thank you. And I also want to say, you know what? When the chips are down, you really know who your friends are out there, okay? Because some of you came out of the woodwork that I haven't heard from in years just to say, hey, Jeff, I hope you're feeling better. So I really appreciate that. That really speaks volumes of the heart. And I like that. And I wanted you to see all the stuff that we give away monthly. I got bags of pay dirt. I got silver bars. I got gold nuggets. I got specimen gold. I got drones. I got big old, I can't pick it up, but I got a big old monster bag of gold over here too. This is just some of the stuff that we give away every month. Oh, you're missing out. I tell you what, if I was you, I'd sign up as a premium patron, lickety split, because we give stuff like this away all the time. And I know you know how to sign up because I say it all the time. You just look for the patron link like that and you click on it like that. And you make a $10 pledge like that. And if you like geology videos, ooh, I got a really cool one that looks like that. Go ahead and watch that one and it'll teach you a lot. And I'll see you on the next video.